Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Maureen Dumas, and I am the Vice President of Advancement and University Relations here at Johnson & Wales University. Thank you for joining us for today's session, a celebration of Women's History Month, JU Alumni in Leadership. We are thrilled to bring you this program featuring three dynamic alumni who have risen through the ranks at their, at their organizations or at companies that they currently have owned and started. We are grateful they have taken the time to be with us today to share their experiences and expertise and to answer your questions. Questions can be submitted through the, the session utilizing the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. These questions will be posed to our panelists during the Q&A section of the presentation. I'd now like to introduce today's moderator, Marie Bernardo Souza, president of the JWU Providence campus. Marie Bernardo Souza has spent 30 year career in higher education at Johnson Wales University. She came to the Providence campus as an undergraduate student and her first position was in the registrar's office in 1988. What followed began her trajectory of positions of progressive responsibility. In March, 2019, she was appointed Providence campus president. With a keen commitment to the student experience, Dr. Bernardo Souza has a long history of fostering collaboration among departments and across JWU's two campus system to facilitate the creation and revision of policies and operational efficiencies and improvements. She also manages staff through ongoing redesign and change initiatives to ensure students received an exceptional academic experience, optimum care and service. Dr. Bernardo Souza holds a doctorate in law and policy from Northeastern University, a master's of science degree from Emanuel College, and a bachelor of science degree from Johnson & Wales University. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Marie Bernardo Souza. Thank you, Maureen. It is an absolute honor to moderate today's panel. I'm in awe by the talent, grit, and experiences of our panelists. It's so fitting that we have this opportunity today at a university that was founded by two women in 1914, years before women had the right to vote. These pioneering women, Gertrude Johnson and Mary Wales, seized an opportunity and ignored the naysayers who did not believe in the capacity of women to run a business or to educate the future of our country. Ms. Johnson and Ms. Wales established a school that grew into a university with purpose that is still alive and well today. Our founders share so many of the same attributes with these women on our panel today, passionate, bright, courageous, competitive, creative, and comfortable with being uncomfortable, a recipe for success. The talent in today's panel is extensive. And for me, it is an honor to moderate our discussion with such impressive and visionary women. I'm going to welcome each of our panelists and invite them to turn on their cameras. Starting with Sarah Sorelli, Providence campus graduate from 2007. Sarah, you are internationally recognized marketing strategist having spent over 15 years executing growth, marketing, and business development strategies to professional services for firms, nonprofits, and growing businesses. You jump-started your career with the accounting profession's famous viral video sensation and digital strategy. And you were honored by Accounting Today as one of the top 100 most influential people in the accounting profession two years in a row, and you were hand-selected as an attendee of the first ever Forbes Under 30 Summit before reaching the age of 30. Sarah, thank you for being on the panel and for being such a committed alum. Would you kindly share with us the most impactful woman in your life? 
absolutely. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. This is so fun. Um, you know, I am, I am absolutely my mother's daughter through and through. There's really no other answer that I can share. Um, might not be the most unique answer, but uh, she, she, she's the best woman out there. My husband's mother too, just an absolutely killer woman. And at the risk of sounding totally uncool this, this early on in the program, I'm also a bit of a Disney nerd. So while fictional, I love so many of the Disney stories, Moana in particular. She's, a, she's another badass bee. I love her. Sarah, thank you for that. Um, and it's amazing how Disney's view of women and their characters has changed over time. So um, that's something that we should try to unpack at a later point in the conversation. Thank you so much. I'd now like to introduce Kat Cole, or should I say Dr. Kat Cole. Kat received her honorary doctorate from J. Wu's Charlotte campus in 2017. Kat, you're an investor, an advisor to high growth businesses, funds and brands with a focus on food and beverage, wellness franchises, SMB tech, and Web3. Having started your career at Hooters as a waitress, you became a corporate employee by 20, a VP by 26, and led the company's global growth as a member of the global executive team, culminating in the company's sale into private equity in 2010. You went on to lead Focus Brands as COO and president prior to your current role as president and chief operating officer at Athletic Greens. You're a young global leader of the Economic Forum, a member of the board of directors of Growth Stage VC and PE back companies, Milk Bar and Slice, as well as the board of Human Co. SPAC. You were named one of Fortune's 40 under 40 and have been featured on CBS's Undercover Boss during your time at Cinnabon. Kat, could, would you highlight for us the most influential woman in your life? You're very similar to Sarah. Um, you know, there are many women who have been inspiring and helpful and advocates um, and mentors, but my mom I was raised by a single parent. Um, she modeled a level of leadership behavior that would create an imprint and then eventually become a model for my own leadership. And uh, she at 65 is a small business owner today and uh, just continues to inspire me and in her desire to create an impact through business and through independence. So my mom. Kat, thank you so much. And moms really do, are the driving force behind so much of our success. And we're so fortunate to have that strong foundation. It's now my pleasure to welcome our final panelist to the screen, Diane Dre, class of 1977. Diane is a senior executive with over 30 years of experience leading a privately held for-profit bottled water manufacturing company which she sold in 2008 to an international firm and retired early. Since then, you have volunteered as a business counselor with SCORE, New York City chapter, helping entrepreneurs launch and run profitable entities and have started your own program, Money 101, which covers all aspects of personal finance. Diane, you also have extensive experience in real estate and recently published a book on and guide for building owners and cooperative and condominium boards on how to comply with the New York City law related to safe building facade conditions. Welcome, Diane. Who do you identify as the most influential woman in your life? Thank you. Well, this is going to be very boring, but I had to give it some thought. When I was growing up, most of the people in business were men. I was always surrounded by them and they had a lot of impact on me. But as I've gotten older, when I look back at the women who really set foundations of what was important in life, I'd also have to say my mother. But I will add that we had a very difficult relationship. And I don't think I appreciated her. I hope she's listening. I don't think I appreciated her until she passed away. And I began to see that what was important to her, uh, which was family, balance in life, uh, being kind to others, are, were actually excellent principles to run your life, not just your business. So hats off to my mother. Thank you, Diane. So truly amazing women on our panel today, influenced by amazing women who were their mothers. 
mother-in-laws and grandmothers. So let's get our presentation started today with some questions. I know each of you has had such interesting career progression. Would you please share a pivotal career moment that was impactful and led you to where you are today? And Sarah, do you mind if we start with you? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, you know, this question makes me laugh. It's both embarrassing and hysterical to think about, and I think about it all the time. Uh, I'll tell I'll tell this story as fast as I can. So I remember when I was about one or two years into, like right out of school in my career, I'm doing what I, you know, I was doing what I'm doing now, but for another firm, a, a large accounting firm. And, you know, I had the best boss ever for a very short period of time. Her name was Kate Scaglioni, and she was invited to the executive committee meeting, right, which is just a, a bunch of old white men. We had a marketing project that we were going to be working on, and, and Kate, bless her heart, that day said, you know what, this would be great experience for Sarah. Let me bring her along. And I had not been prepared for anything like this. I had never been in a room with that many important people at one time. I remember I was like wearing Hannah Montana socks that one day. I'm like, I'm pulling down my, the bottom of my pants. You know, I didn't want them to see that. Um, and I remember, you know, before they got to the part of the meeting that was relevant to, to the project that we would be working on, they were discussing an older partner who was retiring that year. And one of the executive committee members cracked a joke. And our CEO said, now, now, you know, let's let the man retire with a little bit of dignity. And they moved on. And uh, we finished talking about the project. And, you know, before we concluded the meeting, we circled back around to that topic of the partner that was retiring. Um, where only this time the CEO cracked a joke about this guy. So do, have you ever had like a thought, a, a, a bunch of words that originates in your stomach and you feel it coming up and you're like, oh, this is coming out, whether I like it or not. Um, and it did. And I turned to the CEO and I said, what was that about dignity? And then there was this moment of silence that felt like it was about 10 to 15 years long before Kate swiveled her chair and she looked at Bill. And she was like, oh, she just called you out. And the whole room burst into laughter. And, you know, in, in that moment of silence, I, I had already been like mentally applying for other jobs and packing my desk. And, I, you know, this is it for me. And um, and it took Bill, it took the CEO about three or four years before he told me that at that moment he knew what type of leader I was going to be and what type of you know professional I was going to be. And, um, and I didn't really understand it then. And I don't necessarily um, recommend being a smart ass. I think it was the Jersey in me that came out at that moment, but I did learn the value in taking up space and being your, your authentic self. And while for me, it tends to be a, a little sarcastic and, uh, and a little, you know, and involve a little bit of humor, but you know, I love humor. I, I learned the importance of using my voice at that point. And, and I'll never, ever forget that, you know, learning not to shrink back and instead taking up space and speaking up and letting a little bit of your human come out. And I, I always think back to that moment, um, which was just one of those moments I'll never forget, which scared, scared me so much at that point in my career, but really valuable lesson learned. Sarah, thank you for sharing that story. I mean, let's, let's talk first about of, of the courage it took to lean in and make that kind of statement. But in so many ways, you held that CEO accountable um, for what he was looking for and how he should be developing leaders. So thank you for sharing that. Kat, I know you've had a tremendous um, career progression that's moved really quickly. Can you share with us a, a pivotal career moment that was impactful and led you to where you are today? One was incredibly early. Um, I was 19 years old, a waitress, first person in my family um, to go to college. I was an electrical engineering and computer sciences major and a psychology of women minor. And my restaurant company was growing very quickly. This was Hooters restaurants opening around the world. And uh, even though I did not have a passport and I had never been on an airplane ever uh, and had only been out of the state of Florida a few times in my life for sports competitions, when I was asked to be a member of the training team that would travel internationally to go open our franchise, I said yes, before I had a passport. Uh, and I had never opened a restaurant before, And but I said yes. And so that yes then led to me buying my first ever plane ticket, flying to Miami to stand in line to get my passport expedited, and then eventually leaving to go to Australia, uh, which was a pretty big, uh, well, second flight, if you count my Miami flight to get my passport, but a pretty big first material flight 
uh, to go be there for 40 days and help launch the franchise. And I learned so much about business and openings and building a brand in other countries uh, and across oceans, but I thought it was a once in a lifetime opportunity. And so it seemed very low risk to say yes to me. And then as luck would have it, the company continued to grow. And so the business and the leadership team at the corporate office asked me to go to Mexico City a few months later and launch the first of our franchises uh, in Central America. And then that would keep happening. And so this one yes and that experience led to additional opportunities that then turned into uh, a career season of opening businesses around the world that I still reflect upon today in some of the way I think about building brands, managing boards, leading teams. It was incredibly foundational leadership experience going around the world with teams I had never met before in countries where I'd never been, often where I did not speak the language that built a level of strength and resilience and leadership muscle um, that would last me a lifetime uh, and an entire, you know, several decades of careers and will likely continue to power my thinking into the future. Kat, that is such a wonderful story and I think exemplifies the power of yes, right? And often women kind of uh, sit in the back and don't have the courage to say yes. And that one yes led to such a, a tremendous career trajectory for you. So, so thank you for sharing that with us today. Diane, would you share with us one of those pivotal career moments that was impactful and, and led you to where you are today? Sure. Um... I, um, I came, my, my career was spent in a family business and I was the third generation to enter. I came in right after college um, and I you know, was trying to find my way in the world. My father was still in charge, but he quickly retreated. But he had one big fear, uh, which he had since childhood, he told me, uh, whatever, you, whatever happens, the worst thing that could possibly happen to our company is that we would become unionized because then you lose total control mm -hmm. and you cannot direct your workforce. Um, so I was, you know, coming up the ranks and getting to know what was going on in our manufacturing end and in our repair centers and in our office. And I got the feeling that we, we would put water in five gallon bottles. And I got the sense that some of it was disappearing. It was being stolen or we couldn't account for it. And so uh, as a young woman, I was about 31 years old, I decided to do some investigation. And I always remember one guy, one of my truck drivers sitting with him, this is going back 40 years ago. And I said, you know, it's a strange thing. Um, you went out with 120 bottles, you brought back tickets for 80 bottles. And I thought that when we, and then we decided to count your truck, which nobody had ever done. But instead of finding 40 bottles, we only found 10. So like, what, what's wrong? Are you missing a ticket here or something? Well, sure enough, I had pricked a boil and um, I had, there was a massive theft going on and our truck drivers, only a few of them, but enough were selling our product off route. And, um, and he figured I got wind of it. And so he went running to a union to try to get protection. And within a few days, my father's greatest fear occurred, which is we got a, a note from that our business was about to be unionized. My father was so upset, he had a stroke and died. So all of a sudden, I'm 32 years old, I have 140 employees, I've got a union drive on my hands. And my mother was having a very difficult time with my father's death. Uh, so that had other, other um, ramifications. The, the workers in trying to get uh, power and, and feeling this out for the first time staged a work slowdown. And I had to hire an attorney and negotiate my first union contract, which I didn't even know which way was up. The next six months of my life were so difficult, but I made it through. And I settled my contract. I got on great terms with the union. I hired detectives to track our employees. And when I found out the depth of the theft, we fired them and the union totally backed me up. And I came out of that period with such strength that I really know I could probably face anything. 
And so what I'm really saying is out of this tremendous difficult time, I became a stronger businesswoman um, at age 32. So that, Diane, that's my moment. Diane, thank you for um, illustrating, you know, just the, the path and the path isn't always easy. And oftentimes we stumble along the way through the process. But one of the things that just jumps out at me um, in your story is the concept of some of the things we fear the most actually kind of set the stage for the best chapter in our lives. And, and you can see how your business then grew under your leadership, even with a union in place. So Absolutely. tremendous. Kat, if you don't mind, the next question's for you. Being at the top of your organization in today's current climate um, across the world, what are the expectations you have and the expectations um, of leaders and how they've changed over the past two years, right? So we've all been through COVID and our work has changed, our expectations have changed, and you know the world climate isn't as peaceful as we anticipated. So what are your thoughts in terms of, of your expectations and um, how it's changed for leaders across the country? What hasn't changed is people still expect a leader to lead and be accountable and to build teams and organizations that endure. What has changed is what falls under each of those agreements. Um, one thing that has continued to change and evolve is the degree to which uh, a leader is accountable for impact of their decisions beyond their employees and their shareholders and how the thinking around community, culture, social elements start to become at minimum heavily influenced by what a company does at maximum directly affected. And so there's just this broadening of the purview of a leader that in any given point in time is expected and that expectation varies um, around the world by stakeholder. And so this, who are we leading? Who are we influencing? What are we accountable and responsible for has certainly scope crept and expanded over time. The next is the you know, ability to lead teams and companies that endure. And enduring requires a level of looking around corners, understanding the unpredictability of the world and our industries and environments, and still being able to lead and navigate through that uncertainty that many will get so tired of hearing is the new normal. And people expect us to be able to navigate through those moments, those seasons, and those times. And the reality is if we don't, the competition will. Someone is figuring out how to endure through supply chain crisis. Someone is figuring out how to endure through difficult or highly competitive talent environments. And so if you don't, your competition will. And certainly people expect and want their leader to be uh, the one or the ones who are figuring that out. Thank you, Kat. Um, can you share with us, how do you inspire your leaders around you to look around corners and to dig a little deeper? Do you have some strategies that you apply? Sure. Um, one would be staying incredibly close to the customer and the employee. No matter how big we get, one of the most toxic elements of growth or risks is you become disconnected from the truth of your customer and your employee. And so um, there are many ways to do that, some of them very structured and tech enabled, whether it's research, data, insight, surveys, um, but nothing beats good old fashioned talking to your customers and people. Um, skip level meetings, staying close. It is, it is so fascinating how if you talk to enough of your customers and employees personally, that you start to see patterns in what people want and what they need that often ties to what you might hear from your executive team or see in your reporting that start to make priorities radically clear yeah. and then leading around those. So I use forms of check-ins, literally monthly check-ins with skip level team members all throughout the world, all throughout the company, personally talking to customers on a regular basis. Uh, and making sure I'm doing that in a way that doesn't feel that it's micromanagement for my great leaders, but rather that they feel it's support from the top to empathize with what's going on across the company. 
I think it's a great example of authentic leadership. So our next question, um, I think many can attest that a woman's career trajectory is just different than that of men. And sometimes women delay or forego asking for what they deserve, whether it's a title or salary. What advice would you give to our listeners uh, today about how we can help change these perceptions and encourage um, women to ask for what they deserve uh, without apprehension. Diane, would you comment on that? Yes, um, I think that the key to any adversary or any situation which could go south is always to have plan B and plan C in place before you do the negotiation. So if you're gonna go in there and you're going to say, you know, I'm looking for a higher position, I'm looking for a higher salary, you have to already anticipate, well, if they say no, what am I gonna do? And if you are very, I, I never believe in bluffing. I mean, I think that's a very, very bad, never say I'm gonna leave if I don't get this. Well, you don't know if you're gonna leave unless you have another job. So having plan B and plan C in place before you make that request will give you a tremendous sense of strength because you already know what your next step can be. Um, and that's all I have to say. Thank you, Diane. Sarah, what are your thoughts um, about a woman's career path and their trajectory? Yeah, Marie, you know, I honestly don't know if this is a woman thing or just a human thing in general. Trust me, I know plenty of men with the inability to communicate what they want. Trust me, I think I've dated all of them. And I will and I will just never understand this concept. I mean, you wouldn't walk into a deli and go, I'll have whatever. You know, what are what are the chances of you enjoying the sandwich that you get? You go in and you say, I want chicken, Swiss lettuce, tomato, mustard, toast the bread, like it's the same concept. And, and I don't think we need to overcomplicate it any further than that. Personally, I don't even think it's the asking for what we want. That's the hardest part. I think it's the knowing what we want. That's the hardest part. And giving ourselves the, you know, the, the grace to, to go for it and, and to, to want what you want. Um, you know, first you just need to know what it is and that's what you want, not what Instagram tells you to want or what mom says you should want, right? You have to be willing to have that, you know, that honest conversation with yourself first before you go and, and you ask for it. And, and then, um, you know, you figure out who can help you get there and identify those allies, whether it's internally, externally, whoever it is, stay very close to those people, ask for help, ask for, for support, and then just be crystal clear. I mean, I, I was borderline annoying when I was going for, for an officer level position here at Grassi. I, I checked in every few months with my leadership, um, reminding them that this is what I was working towards and how are we doing and how exactly do I earn this, right? I wasn't asking to be given it. I was asking, how do I earn this? How does anybody earn this? And I kept my receipts and you know I, I saved all of my data. And, and by the time I, I was sitting in that chair and ready to have that conversation. I said, this is what you said. This is what I did. Are we ready or what? Right. And, and, and it happened. Um, and I think we just need to be comfortable with wanting what we want and knowing what that is. And then just go ahead and ask for it exactly how you want it and leave no room for error. And, and your chances will, will increase that way. Sarah, I love the analogy of being at the deli counter and knowing exactly what you want to order and being very specific. Um, and I think your point about that this is not just an issue for women, it's also an issue for men. And I don't know if it's, it seems to be much more um, top of mind with this generation of young people coming into the workforce where this question of like, how do I get there? And how quickly do I get there? What's my roadmap? That seems to be very critically important. And for individuals to find success, I think it is knowing your own mind. So thank you um, for highlighting that. Kat, what are your thoughts on this, on the same topic? No, I, I have to agree this. I mean, there's all kinds of research that says in general, of course, there are exceptions, but the, um, the the data suggest that women wait to have more of the qualifications than men before saying yes. We talk ourselves out of opportunities. Again, likely the women who are on this panel are exceptions to that and may not relate fully, but I have observed it. 
And, uh, and so this idea of, um, as Sarah said, knowing what you want and having some clarity and ownership. And I love the way she said, it's not that I'm like asking for a favor or a role. I'm asking, what do I need to do to get there? Similarly, when I have been interviewed for positions, all of which have been stretches from whatever role I was in at the time, what I didn't do was say, oh, well, you know, I don't have as much experience in supply chain. And so I may not be as strong as other candidates. I said, I don't have um, very much experience and direct oversight of supply chain. Here's what I would need from you to be successful in this role, given I am so strong in these other areas. It's a slight twist. Perfect. I'm still highlighting that, yeah, I'm aware that there are varying degrees of strength of any candidate in any areas. I'm incredibly strong in these areas. Here are the receipts. Here are the examples. And I need to know from you that I'll have a partner and support and resources in these areas to help me fully step into the role that I'm interviewing for. And so these ways of thinking about what we know and what we don't know in a very empowering way and articulating them in a way that leads to excitement and support and belief in me as a partner that will grow and evolve over time versus being so caught up in my own head around how I may compare that then not only calls um, calls out areas, but that kind of calls into doubt my ability to lead through um, the unknown or areas of responsibility that may come over time. It's a great way to reframe the narrative. Diane, mentorship has uh, long been said to be a key factor for the growth and preparation of strong leaders. You are a volunteer business counselor with SCORE, the New York City chapter. Would you please share with us your thoughts on, on mentorships and your experience as a mentor? Sure. Um, first, I'd like for those who don't know what SCORE is, SCORE is a volunteer arm of the Small Business Administration. We have, we're throughout the United States, we have about 11,000 uh, executives that have dedicated their time to help other business owners. And we work out of about 325 chapters. Uh, things have drastically changed since COVID. Mentoring used to be always face-to-face -face where you'd go to an office and you'd meet with a mentor, uh, but now it's almost exclusively done on Zoom. And that means that you can really use any of the 11,000 uh, mentors throughout the United States. All mentoring, no matter how many times you go, is 100% free. And uh, so I became a mentor right after I sold my business and retired. And I always use the word young because it was a, I retired about uh, 12, 13 years ago. And um, up until then, I hadn't known about SCORE, but I joined the organization and it's wonderful because what people do is they come in and they're generally in startup phase and they need guidance in everything from their marketing, their branding, their accounting, their legal area, the strategy of how they're going to reach the customers, very often they don't even know the right questions to ask. And so what we do at SCORE is we try to coach them through private 100% confidential sessions to progress and move their business further and further. So over the past 13 years, I've had lots of different roles at SCORE, uh, but I've counseled about a thousand entrepreneurs. That's in almost every area you could think of. And I always tell clients who are coming in, the mentoring process is only as good as the person you hook up with. So if you don't feel that connection and they haven't really helped you, they didn't answer the question, I say, go try the other 10,999, okay? You really can keep going. Uh, a good relationship, will st you'll stick with them over time. I've had clients that have consulted me on and off for multiple years. Um, and it's just great to see them grow. And you often, as a school, or mentor, if you don't have expertise in one area, you refer them to see a, uh, another mentor that you might know who, who is an expert there. Uh, I think it's critical that every entrepreneur have a team behind them. 
and it cannot be your employees. You have a different relationship with them. It cannot be your family, or I can say it should be in addition to your family and in addition to your employees. It should be outsiders who have been there and done that and that they can say, hey, did you ever think of it from a different perspective? So um, if you are starting a business, if you are in business and you want to grow the business or you just want to educate yourself more, SCORE is a wonderful free resource. I wish I had known about it when I was running my own company. I learned about it in retirement. So that's... Diane, thank you for your commitment to mentorship. I'm sure that um, as you've been mentoring individuals over the past 13 years or so, um, you've met some incredible leaders and seen some tremendous Amazing. success stories. So um, thank you for, for being passionate about paying it forward. Yes. The um, terminology authentic leadership is one that's batted about um, so much these days. I'm, I'm curious what it takes to be an authentic leader from your lens, Kat. How do you view authentic leadership? It's really the degree to which you're comfortable bringing your humanity forward. And, you know, the word authenticity gets thrown around so much. Mm -hmm. um, and I've found it in my experience with other leaders, just being clear on what it's not. Authenticity doesn't mean you have permission to be so you that you are unthoughtful or insensitive to cultural dynamics or what's going on in the world. When I traveled around and opened businesses in other countries, um, some people's definition of authenticity, which is be you at all costs, don't change who you are, would have me walking into a country saying, sorry, I don't speak your language, you need to speak mine, or this is me, take it or leave it. And there's a degree of that um, that can get misinterpreted, especially by a younger audience as they navigate a complex world that sounds like you have the room and the right to be unthoughtful or insensitive to other dynamics, particularly cultural ones, cultural like actual culture of people's lived experiences, but also company culture and cultures of different customers you may sell to. And so authenticity doesn't give us the right to be um, you know, a bull in a porcelain shop. Uh, what it does mean is we should not have to fundamentally change who we are. And I have been in many situations where I turned up or down the volume on one of my styles or approaches in order to get the work done. That wasn't being inauthentic. It was understanding the fastest path to getting the work done. But I would stop short of violating my values, not being honest about what I thought and who I am. So there is this area in the middle, if you call it the extremes, being so who you are in every way that you just walk through the world with no regard for others. And on the other side is being so concerned about what people think that you have a high degree of emotional labor, meaning you're putting so much energy into being someone you think others expect you to be, that you're draining the energy that would otherwise go into work. And there is a giant swath of room in the middle to navigate the world and say what you think, what you believe and be who you are in a way that brings others along with you and has people likely being as productive as possible in your presence or under your leadership. Kat, that's tremendous. I think um, you highlighted the importance of having your own moral compass, um, understanding your values as it relates to your leadership style. So thank you for that. Sarah, what are your thoughts um, as it relates to authentic leadership? Oh yeah, Kat, Kat nailed it. And even as she's speaking and I'm listening to her, I'm thinking um, about my earlier example about being in the boardroom that day and, and having that little moment of word vomit. And I got a little lucky that day. I did, you know, that that situation might not have had that same ending um, depending on who was in that room. And, and an authentic leader to me, you know, I am a know your strategic strengths kind of girl. I may capitalize on your advantages, know your strengths, give yourself every opportunity to leverage those strengths and advantages as you possibly can. I know mine, you know, I choose to capitalize on them. I know that um, in that moment, you know, I, I am somewhat confident. I, I ha 
speaking up does come easier for me. I am able to use humor sometimes to disarm, right? These are things that I learned about myself over the years. Um, but I do also know my blind spots, right? And, and to Kat's earlier point, you know, once you know your blind spots, you're able to chart your course and fill in your gaps and build that greater strategy. And, and I also lead my team this way, right? So if I know somebody on my team, it, um, loves to write, hates to speak. I'm going to work with this person and give them every possible opportunity to write and be successful rather than begging for them to get better at something that they don't enjoy and they just not good at, right? It's a much more fulfilling way to live. That's not to say we're going to ignore every opportunity to get better. We're going to work on those things, but we're sure as heck not going to focus on it, right? And, you know, I learned too that there are so many people out there just kind of waiting for somebody to be their authentic self because it gives them the permission to do the same. And I, I've said this before, I'll say it again, like watch people light up when you love them exactly for what they are and not asking them to be anything else other than, than who they are. Um, they're just the best possible version of themselves. So whenever I have the opportunity to do that, I, I really do love to do that. Um, it's just a powerful space to play in. And I'm very fortunate that I was raised in a way where I, I knew the value in doing that, um, both for myself and, and for those around me. And, and um, I'm just grateful to be able to, to celebrate my authentic self and hopefully give as many people the permission to, to be that same type of person. Um, both personally and professionally, because I've even seen different versions of myself um, being put in a situation or an environment when I was given that freedom versus when I wasn't, um, it's, it's, it can be, it can, it can be very revealing. Sarah, I, I think your, your response highlights, um, what a tremendous leader you are in terms of entrusting your team and building upon their strengths and leveraging their gifts so that they can bring their best self to work. So tremendous. I think all of us know that we want to trust our instinct and, and trust our intuition. It can be really valuable in so many different situations. Yet many people don't have the confidence to trust their intu intuition. Would each of you share a piece of advice that you received and decided not to take um, that made a difference in your experience? And Sarah, can we begin with you? Yeah, you know, I love this question and I don't think anybody has ever asked me this question before. So I had to sit down and think about it. You know, I grew up in a male dominated industry, right? Accounting, business consulting, it's still very, you know, primarily male. So um, 15 years, this is all I've ever done in my life. Uh, this is might come off somewhat controversial, but stick with me. Um, you know, so naturally on, on more than one occasion, I, I found myself in a room full of women like powering together against the man, right? And, and as a woman, you know, I'll have to do all of these things to succeed because men think and behave in, in all these terrible ways and women have to stick together because they always have each other's back, right? Um, but I found it interesting because really the only obstacles that I have ever had in my career have been women, interestingly enough. So I've actually found that some women are worse and, and I will never understand how some women can treat another woman so badly, knowing how hard it can be to be a woman, right? So I'm like, oh, wait a second. I'm like, this is not what I've been told. Um, so I had to learn very early on in my career not to see myself through the perspective of someone else and to understand that everyone is viewing and seeing things through their own lens, their own experiences, their own motivations, um, not necessarily men, not necessarily women, but humans in general. Um, so there is this level of awareness that is is important in every situation with every different type of person. So I, I learned um, how important it was to ignore some of these generalizations that they're, they were drilling down on me and to make decisions based on my, my own experiences and, um, and how powerful it is to take extreme ownership over what I can control and the decisions that I make, right? Um, I can't, these two books, right? This is like, I love this daily stoic, right? I don't know if you guys are into stoicism, right? I love, I love that. And then just like the hardcore version, right? Extreme ownership. Um, but these concepts, uh, I, I really learned some, some lessons earlier on and 
went against some advice that I had been given about men versus women and, and um, decided to, to kind of just make some of my, ignore some of those generalizations and, and make some, some decisions on my own and take extreme ownership over those. I think it, it speaks to your lived experience. So thank you so much for, for that answer. Diane, what are your thoughts? Uh, it's interesting. Well, I, I actually have two quick stories. So the first story is when um, my, my bottled water company was located in Manhattan in a very tiny congested building, and we had to get out of the city. And I went looking for a new place to call our new headquarters bottling plant. And I found in a, I had been looking for a long time. I found an abandoned building. It hadn't been occupied in, in 10 years, uh, totally rusted in the middle of nowhere at that time. And it had certain aspects that I knew in my heart were right and that it would be a great location. It's in a place called Liberty State Park right next to the Statue of Liberty. And so I went ahead and bought this uh, facility and my truck driver, came out and they were all very curious. They had heard a rumor that the company was gonna move and they went back and they took a look at the building and they came back and told everyone she has lost her mind because it was so awful. And it turned out to be, I knew in my heart it was the right place. We poured a couple of million dollars of borrowed money into the facility. And it actually, not only did it turn out to be a great location, it was my ticket to ultimately selling my business because my competitor wanted that plant so badly that they bought me. That was story number one, where I didn't listen to my truck drivers as much as I love them. Story number two was much more serious. Uh, we were a family business. I inherited one member of the family uh, as a, my sales manager, and we were. I had a great deal of difficulty with his leadership, and the our industry was under attack. And he was not able to adapt and change. And my entire board told me that in order to move the company forward, I would have to let him go. Remember, this is a family member who my father had handpicked and had been with us for 32 years. And I couldn't do it. I was just, it was too, I was frozen. I was so frightened. How could you do this to someone? How could you be so disloyal? And the company continued to go down and down and down. And it took me three years of anguish and sleepless nights until I finally made the move. And of course, my board was right. I should have done it a long time sooner. Um, our company didn't totally uh, zoom up, but we did were able to attract talent that put us in a new place. Um, so I don't know if that's an example. That's an example of not taking advice, but I should have, but I ultimately did. Uh, and so those are my two stories. Diane, thank you. I, I think the first story just highlights the importance of intuition, right? Yeah, you right. knew that was the right space. And I think your second story really just speaks to sometimes we know the right thing to do, but we're torn by all these other, the noise everywhere Absolutely. else. So um, thank you for sharing that. Kat, what are your thoughts about um, intuition and, and how that plays into decisions that we make and um, maybe some advice that you didn't take that would have made a difference? Yeah, I think it is important to recall that in the moments when I haven't taken advice, many of us have possibly equal numbers of scenarios like what Diane described. On one hand, advice that we didn't take and they were right. Uh, and on other hand, the, you know, the advice that we didn't take and it worked out in our favor. And so I would encourage everyone who's listening not to ever confuse this question and these discussions that you're always right. <laughs> um, and so similarly, I've received advice on what to do with people. Um, that's, everyone has a lot of advice, especially investors and board members and uh, owners. I remember when I took over as president of Cinnabon, the private equity company who owned the company outright, 100%, um, had very strong opinions about the existing executive team and what they believed I needed to do with those executives, some who I should promote, 
others who I should promptly lead to the door. And um, I said, thank you for your input. I am the leader that you've hired to make these decisions. And I have to have some amount of time as frustrating to you as it may be to make my own assessments. And in a few cases, they were right. Um, but I had other considerations for how those changes need to happen, uh, as opposed to I'm here day one and I'm going to be the person who fires the people no one else wanted to. Uh, I had to be really thoughtful about the impact on the organization, just not what needed to happen in function by function. There were other examples where they were completely wrong and it, the person wasn't the problem. It was the role we had them in. Uh, and in fact, putting them in a different role allowed a different version of them to be visible across the organization and they could thrive because they had been promoted beyond their capability because of their tenure. And it happens all the time in companies. I've been here. I know where the bodies are buried. I, under, I have all the relationships. And so I get promoted. At some point, the organization may change enough, whether it's for growth or other reasons, where that person in that role is no longer anywhere near what you would put, who you would put in that role if you were hiring it from the outside or starting all over. And in fact, the organization is suffering because of what that person does not have in their experience set. And many people don't have the courage to have that conversation. And so I'll just broadly bucket it with advice on people um, that has gone either way. I've also had um, advice on what decision to make around a complex opportunity or problem in the company. And sometimes that advice leans more in the outcome that would save money or make money short term. And when I'm the leader, that is responsible for the team, the reputation and the relationships over time, I see the bigger picture and say, actually, if you want our company to be valuable over time, I have to protect the relationships with this customer or these key leaders or these stakeholders. And so while you're not going to love it because it may feel like giving back money in this case or walking away from an opportunity in this case, it's my job to show you what builds the enterprise value over time. And so taking a short-term um, money negative decision here is going to lead to a long-term money positive decision over here. And often those conversations are happening with board members and investors. And so understanding how to manage those that can feel um, intimidating to some or directive by remembering what the role you're in is responsible for is an, an, an incredible reminder for how to navigate advice either way. Right. I, I think both examples illustrate the importance of empowerment, um, but also the connection to sustainability for your company long term, right? Ensuring that you, the people are on the right seats on the bus in order to move your company forward and ensuring that decisions have the long view versus the short view. So thank you for that. I know we are all familiar with the, the term work-life balance, but recently we've heard going beyond balance to achieving wholeness. And um, it takes the concept of work-life balance even further and includes volunteerism, hobbies, and travel, or anything that would bring you life fulfillment. Um, so for each of you, do you believe it's possible? to attain wholeness? And what do you have to do to have balance or wholeness in your life? Diane, would you like to kick us off? Sure. Um, every time I hear the work-life balance, I often feel that it's just like another pressure on young people and working people to live up to somebody else's ideal. The truth is, especially if you're a young, career parent, you don't have enough time in the day. I mean, there's just 24 hours does not cover it. And it's, and, and by making you feel like you should be doing so much stuff and you should be volunteering and you should be with your kids at their school show and you should be making presentations to boards, it just puts more burdens on people. And I think one of the things to do when you get confidence as you get older, say, I can't do it all. And it's not the time in my life to do it all. I had no time for volunteering until I was almost finished with my career. 
Now I have all the time in the world to volunteer and I love it. But had you asked me to do that when I was a single parent raising three small kids and just going between the office and their school events was enough to make anybody crazy, it's impossible. You know, I now have time to exercise. Guess what? I spend two hours a day in the gym. It's great, but I'm retired. So I think what I would say is pick your priorities, pick a few things. Don't feel like you have to live up to somebody else's expectation and stop beating yourself up that you're not perfect because nobody is. Thanks, Diane. That's important for us all to keep in mind because um, I think what, what you just shared with us illustrates the importance of a different phases. Wholeness equals something very different for each of us and it's very personal. So, so thank you for that. Kat, what are your thoughts about achieving wholeness or balance? Very similar to Diane. I mean, I, I, I know what people mean when they say balance, but it, you know, those of us who've been in the trenches at various seasons of life know that the actual term balance where the scales just sit here perfectly aligned does not exist. If it does, it's for a fleeting moment on their way up or down. And I'm a mom of a four-year-old and a two-year-old. I didn't have my first kid until uh, literally I gave birth 60 days after I was promoted to president and COO and then went out on maternity leave. And so the reality is these life stages and seasons of what we, where we have interests and responsibilities don't always line up perfectly with when we have the most time from a professional perspective. And so my counsel is first and foremost, root in your values. Whatever your values are, you can literally Google a list of common values in, and it does vary by Western world, traditional Eastern world, different cultures. Um, but it's a good way to find a list, challenging myself intellectually, gaining income, gaining respect, time with friends and family, my, my faith, right? These are all core areas of values. And it's really helpful to go through an exercise of force ranking them. Not that you have to put one over the other in terms of time and the real world, but if there are 30, then certainly how you spend your time is going to need to really shift and lean more toward the first five or six at any point in your life. And then I use that to reflect and ask, is how I'm spending my time reflective of what I'm saying is most important to me? And to Diane's point, there was a point in my early to mid twenties, I did not have children. Um, and at some points I had a personal uh, intimate relationship, but I loved my work. I was traveling all over the world. Work was my life. And do I believe that it's healthy to be a workaholic? No, but I was in a season of life where that made me happy. It brought me joy. And then some say, well, do you think that choice led to you trading off having children until later? Sure, it, that could be possible, um, but I didn't meet the person that I thought was a great partner to have children with until much later, until a few long-term relationships in a row. And then I was like, oh, this is the one, let's do this. I just happened to have been 39 at the time and then had my first child uh, at 40. And so or at 39, right before I turned 40. And so this idea of rooting in values becomes incredibly important. And then looking for harmony, and having some, I like harmony over balance, like jazz, like a song, it's sort of, you know, sometimes there's a steady beat, other times there's something unexpected, but either way, it's my song at the time. And then having some process to check in with those people who matter. And that is a very short list. So your most intimate relationships, your direct reports, those who you say matter to you most and have a way to check in and create a culture where they can be honest with you and you can be honest with them about how things are going. My husband and I have a check-in every month. We ask ourselves and each other the same six questions. One of them is tell me one thing I can do differently to be a better partner for you. And there may be some weeks where he needs to be really focused on his work. And there may be some weeks where I need to really be focused on my work. And he takes a larger role uh, in our family or in our personal relationship. And our time together may be compressed, but because he is top, top in my world, that I will not allow that to go on for very long. Right. And so this idea of values, 
And then checking in and giving that permission to evolve over time as you continue on life's journey has um, worked a really powerful a, in a really powerful way for me. Kat, thank you for sharing um, your personal story. I think it really speaks to um, calibrating, right? Recalibrating at different phases in our lives, um, which is so important. And it doesn't happen naturally, right? We actually have to work at it and we have to understand what's important to us. So um, looking at the time, I have one more final question before we're gonna transition to the audience to get their questions for our panelists. Um, Sarah, and I'm hoping I can start with you. Um, knowing that all of you are so involved with uh, your communities, charitable organizations, and of course, with Johnson & Wales University, you are here giving of your time for us today, and we thank you for that. But could you share with us your personal philosophy on the culture of giving or philanthropy and why it's so important to give, help, give back and help others? Sarah, do you mind kicking us off? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, this is a no brainer. And even to connect it to the responses that we just heard on wholeness or work life balance, you know, this has always been one of those values that I've rooted myself in. Um, and, and I remember when we were preparing for this panel and, and I was looking at that wholeness question, I actually even wrote, I'm like, please pick somebody else for this question. <laughs> I'm not sure that I'm the best one, but now that I'm listening to, to Kat and Diane, I'm like, no, you know what? I actually do this. I do a pretty good job at this. Um, but one of those values that has just always been so important to me is, is this idea of giving back. And again, it's just something that has always been instilled in me and growing up and, and um, I can make a direct connection to it, just how much I've relied on others giving, right? Growing up and, and um, you know, relying on mentors and, and taking advantage of, of programs and learning from talented people. And, and if I am in a position where I'm able to give something back, um, how could I not? How, how could I not? Um, you know, even, even if it's just a little bit of time, if I'm not doing it, I'm, I'm finding my energy is draining. So this is something that gives me energy. It gives me power. Um, it gives me, um, it, it fuels me and it fuels the other areas of my life. So while it sounds selfless to give, um, I get something back from it. I do. And I have no problem kind of, you know, saying that out loud. And, and some of the best people and experiences and contacts and uh, that I've ever had have been through giving back. It's a little cliche, you get more out of it than you give, but um, everything, really some of the best, just the, the best experiences that I've ever had have been in either giving back or paying it forward. Um, and I find that I am my best version of myself and I'm able to do the most good when I'm putting myself in a position to give back. And, and I just feel like, um, now more than ever, we all have this responsibility and this, this social responsibility. And if we're in a position to give back, um, we kind of owe it to each other a little bit. Um, and if we're, any of us are going to get out of this thing alive, like we gotta, we gotta just, you know, we gotta come forward and, and give back a little bit. And, and, um, I can't, I can't see that that will ever slow down. I hope I I'm all, you know, only in a position where I'm able to do that more and more, but, um, it would be it would be my best advice to make it uh, even just the smallest part of, of, of your, you know, your overall story to be able to give back. Sarah, you can tell from the way you responded to the question that it energizes you uh, to give back. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Kat, I know you're going to have to hop off the call and you wanted just to say uh, goodbye to the audience for a, a quick moment. Yes, um, just wanted to say thank you to everyone. I am accessible on LinkedIn if there are follow-up questions that come from the Q&A. Um, and I've loved so much hearing from Diane and Sarah who are um, bosses on many levels, both professional and personal. And, and you know, on this philanthropy topic, I would just say too, make sure one way to have an impact is to make sure the work you do over time does no harm. And there are some that do a lot of harm through their work or how they do their work, and then write a few checks to try to make it better. And the, you know, really thinking about how do we as leaders lead our businesses to have high impact on our employees and our customers and those that we serve as a mechanism to create positive impact and think about how we can 
use the, the benefit that we get either through influence and or financial gain to continue to invest in those who are doing work on the ground in ways that we're passionate about, but can't or aren't the right people to actually do the work. And I've found that some level of ongoing impact and philanthropic work um, is not only the right thing to do, you know, the statement to for those to whom much is given, much is expected, um, but it also helps diversify my purpose portfolio and gives me a sense of perspective. Often those philanthropic organizations are helping communities or um, efforts around the world that are most deeply needed. And when you are connected to that work, then it helps the things that are in your business, even though it might be not fun or bad, it keeps it in perspective that it's not that bad. Uh, and so I, I, I love the idea of impact and philanthropy as not just the right thing to do as I gain influence or income, but a way to continue to keep my perspective appropriate so that you know we focus on what really matters. So thank you all very much. Kat, thank you so much for joining us. Your responses were spot on, and I think you inspired so many of us today. So thank you. So now I think um, we will begin to transition to the question uh, questions from the audience. And um, Victor has posted a question, and Diane, I think you'd like to answer this, but what is the most influential book that you've read on your leadership journey and why do you feel this way? Well, it's been a long time since I've read business books as I've been retired a while, uh, but I do remember reading Who Moved My Cheese, um, which uh, talked about change and the need to be ready for change. And I think that what happens in any organization is every day is a little bit different. And your ability to be flexible and find a new path and not continue to do the same thing over and over again, um, because you get the same results is was something very important to my leadership. And to have the courage to try different things that are different even if you fail sometimes, okay? Lots of my best business experiences came out of my, not best business, my best learning experiences came out of failures. You, and you can do it once. Usually if you're smart, you don't make the same mistake twice. Great, thank you, Diane. Sarah, what about you? Yeah, there are, there are a few that I like a lot. Um, Principles by Ray Dalio was probably one of the most helpful books I have ever read. Um, it's a it's a doozy. It's a 16 hour audio book if you're into that type of thing. But if you do commuting, it's definitely worth worth listening to. Um, but but really, one of the books that had the most direct impact and quickly um, is the book called The One Thing. So if you're anything like me, um, I tend to get very excited about a lot of things at the same time. Getting, um, being organized has never uh, come easy. It's something that I'm constantly working on. And The One Thing just helps you prioritize, um, gives you a lot of real, uh, actual things that you can do to make sure you're prioritizing your work, when to get things done, uh, how to get them done, how to say yes, how to say no. Um, really good. The one thing had probably the most direct impact on how well I'm able to perform. That's a good one. I highly recommend that one. Thank you, Sarah. Um, the next question's focused on what some of your personal habits or routines are that help you recharge when, you, when your energy or capacity is feeling a little bit low. So Sarah, Diane, I'm not sure who would want to take that. I can jump into that. Uh, it's I learned it from the one thing actually. Um, Time blocking, not a new or novel concept, but the importance of time blocking, I'll actually go as far now to scheduling out time for meditation in the morning, scheduling out time for play, scheduling out time for running, right? And I'll put it on my calendar um, to make sure that I'm treating that re-energizing time as importantly as I am anything else that I have to get done. Um, but I have noticed uh, when I'm not doing that, the quality of my 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 work and the quality of me as a person, I can, I can actually look at myself in the mirror and be like, Oh, Sarah, you don't look so good. Um, you know, you really, so I do, I, I make time for play. I, I, I read and I treat it. I treat it as importantly as I do, you know, for anything else. Great advice. Diane, is there anything you'd like to add? Um, to two things to recharge on, I have 
since my mid forties, I have definitely exercise uh, and being physical has taken a large, large part of my life. And it's always recharges me. And when I neglect it, I can tell. Um, also working with other people, educating them, teaching mm -hmm. them and hearing their life stories that begin every mentoring session with, tell me what you've done since high school. And then I add the words briefly <laughs> because you hear uh, and you begin to realize that maybe your challenges that you thought were just so uh, crushing may not be the worst thing in the world. Other people have faced very big challenges themselves. So when you give back to others, which of course is, it's hard to do when you're, you're on a treadmill yourself, but you be, it, be, it recharges you. Great, thank you so much. Oh, uh, can I just add? When yes. everything else fails, there's always wine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Agreed. That makes it a little easier sometimes, right? Um, one of uh, our guests is asking a question focused on a, a lesson or a takeaway from the recent COVID-19 pandemic. How did it affect you? What are you going to take with you from that experience and, and weave into your life? Sarah, Diane, I'll let Sarah, I'll let Sarah, who's currently in business, talk about that. Yeah, first. this I have to say, for such a terrible, awful, difficult thing to go through, it was some of the most exciting times that I have ever had in my career so far. Um, we, as a firm, did a very good job at being able to pivot our strategy immediately without question given how quickly things changed. Um, it was a very important lesson in being nimble, being able to pivot, um, taking in information and being able to roll with change. Uh, and, and it was exciting. It was difficult to go through. There was a sense of all hands in, that was amazing, but I saw the value firsthand. Um, on, on how, how powerful it is to be able to be flexible and nimble and be able to pivot a strategy, uh, depending on what the market is dictating. It was awesome. Great, thank you, Sarah. Diane, anything you'd want to add? Well, I can, for me, uh, the, the, one of the benefits that came out of the pandemic was really Zoom. So one of the things I didn't mention if SCORE, I talked about the one-on-one -on -one mentoring, but SCORE also gives a lot of classes and courses. And then we always did them in person. And getting to a class is cumbersome for people who are working. Uh, now I teach on Zoom and also I travel a lot. So I was, it was very hard for me to schedule courses. And I just love that techno using the technology. I can be teaching from any part of the world and, uh, and I can engage people a lot easier because they don't have, it's not such an effort to get there. You can't come up with too many excuses about the train was late. So I, that part I do love. Uh, um, I think I will say that for my children who are in their 30s, the ones that are working and are exclusively on Zoom, they haven't gone back to the office, they're working remotely, I see how difficult it is for them. Oops, um, something, something just happened. Whoop. Uh oh, hello, I'm sorry, I don't know, I don't know what something went wrong with my uh, my my screen for a moment anyhow um, i feel like it's a it's an it's a great for your story it was like <laughs> it's I mean, information it, point yeah. i i i just find it uh, it, I actually, the, the lack of human interaction, the it, talking by the water cooler, the speaking about what's going on with your kids. I mean, it's really hard to sit in front of a screen all day. And so the, what I would advise people is to uh, do what Sarah said and block out time and say, I am going to take lunch. I am going to go for a run. I am going to sit and listen to um, a classical piece of music from this time to that time. Find ways to getting the human part back into your life because it's, it's, it's really challenging it's to, to be constantly in front of a screen. And I, I hope, in, to, while I know everybody dreads commuting, I kind of hope that it ends and that people go back to you more human face-to-face -face interactions. I think people are craving it, Diane. Hmm. So it's time for us to get back to normal. Right. Um, the next question is focused on how you transition from leading a small group to a large group 
And then I think, Maureen, are we close to wrapping up? Because We are, Marie. I'm sorry, we're over time. Um, so if maybe we could have one of our panelists answer this question and then we'll close the session if that's okay. I, I can answer that, as I'm sure Sarah can too. I, I would just say this, that in general, in my career, you can only manage closely somewhere between five and seven people. So what, and that's, and it's just reality um, and, and lesser is better. So you have to learn how to trust your managers as a company grows to manage other people. And you have to set up a delegation system. And I think that is a, one of the key lessons I learned early in my career is when someone comes into your office to dump their problem on your desk, make sure they leave with the problem on their to-do list. You can give them advice, you can give them direction, don't take on the job. And I think although that when you're growing a company, you have to let go and let other people do it. Otherwise you will end up, you will not be able to grow your company. That's what Sarah may have other things to add. Yeah, you answered it perfectly. Nothing else to say there. <laughs> Well, I just um, want to close by just saying this has been an incredible session. Um, I feel so fortunate to have spent some time with Sarah, Kat, and Diane um, to learn from each of you and how you've navigated your experiences since leaving our campus. Um, I believe each of you is paving the way for future generations of women, showing us examples of resiliency, courage, and authenticity. So. Thank you for inspiring us today. And Maureen, I'm gonna turn it over to you to close the program. Thank you, Marie. Thank you to our panel of talented alumni and thank you to everyone in attendance today. We celebrate two important women all year, our founding mothers, Gertrude Johnson and Mary Wales. In the spirit of their legacy, we ask that you please consider making a donation today to support current students and the future of our university. During our annual day of giving on March 15, our community will continue the work that Ms. Johnson and Ms. Wales began more than 100 years ago. One J Wu 24 Hours of Giving is all about the participation and the collective impact we can make when we come together. I encourage you to visit giving.jwu.edu and explore all the ways your gifts can impact our students. You can make an early donation today and help us get off to a great start. Gifts of all sizes will have an amplified impact thanks to the Chancellor's Challenge. When we reach our goal of 1,200 gifts, we'll unlock an additional $10,000 in challenge funds from Chancellor Rooney. And if you've already made a gift this year, you can still get involved by becoming a 1J Wu champion and helping to spread the word. Thank you. We sincerely hope that you enjoyed today's session, a celebration of Women's History Month, part of the JWU Connects family of programming. And we hope that you will join us again in the future. For a full listing of upcoming events, please visit our event calendar at alumni.jwu.edu. Thank you again to our alumni panelists for an exceptional and informative program. And thank you to our audience, our loyal alumni, JWU trustees and guests for your attendance. I wish all of you a wonderful day and thank you President Bernardo Sousa as well.